um, invite people to modify those criteria or to argue for their um, um, fit in the larger solidarity kind of frame on some other basis because those are conversations that um, uh, like the conversation this morning in the, in the transition mm -hmm. uh, workshop um, perhaps need to be excavated you know they, they perhaps need to have those those um, uh, debates or the, the, the different perspectives out there in order to um, maybe move forward with, um, I don't know how you move forward with them though. I well, was very, I but was, I was yeah, very and what was symptomatic was when John O'Dell, for instance, used the first person plural in, at one point mm -hmm. in our presentation said we, and then a little later on, when that kind of when we had that eruption around where do corporations fit in, this, are they just outside? Yeah. We never have solidarity with them. He yeah. back to you guys, right? And yes. you know whatever. And I, I mean, yes. w I think we can all feel that way. That move between you, we, yeah. it's hard. Mm -hmm. And and it's interesting. Like I think maps could actually be a very powerful vehicle for thinking about the you and the we, because it's mm -hmm. you know. Emily, I'll just, get in, I'll just get into just the other, oh, oh, and I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> it's okay. I was just trying to uh, to rely on information of self. You know, these people are setting up and identifying themselves in the correct means and methods. Um, but I think social the the purpose of social media right now is not really to connect like to people to talk to is to generate information for market research. That's why Facebook exists. It exists for generating information and that's why companies use social media. So it it's a really, really powerful source of information. There's re like reasons why it's gotten so big, but then on the other hand, like how ethical is generating information these kinds of ways where people are kind of mm -hmm. people are unaware of how much information they're really putting out there on the internet mm -hmm. and all these things. And is that something that is ethical? I don't know. I have to say this. I, I was, this came up in class yesterday, and one of my students told me about how her high school, the administration created a fake Facebook page. <laughs> that wasn't, like, it was just some other, and, and they somehow were able to get all the students to sign up. So then it was this kind of indirect way of monitoring student behavior. Um, so, you know, it's not just marketers, but also other. There's other kinds of surveillance that this now IPO company has has to offer us. But you know, so that I mean, I think you're right. Like the the quality. You said both the quality of the information and the ethics. And um, yeah, I don't know. I don't have I don't have good answers to that question. I know, like with the Ushahidi model, right? The idea is that someone's let's say in Kenya witnessing political violence going on. The idea was that it became a more valid point as the, it got corroborated by other reporters, right? So I mean, here, I, and I think, and I think I am remembering this correctly that in the Italian system, there's like people who self-report as being part of the solidarity economy, but they have somebody else vouch for them too. So they're always around mm -hmm. it. But again, it might be justifiable to have this kind of first pass of like, let's just throw it out there and see who answers the question of how they define themselves as belonging to the solidarity economy. It's like if, if that's the first draft, and then the refinement comes from maybe maybe getting this NSF grant, doing some community research, hiring some Worcester State students to help out with it. Um, and some non-Worcester State, non -Worcester State community, community researchers. Community yeah. 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 Um, just wondering how, how you're going to capture, I guess you said qualitative interviews, but to my mind, one of the most interesting things about visiting Mondragon. I took a week of workshops there and I got to go with my advisor from a grad program uh, in community development. She had studied uh, this group of people for since 1980. So I was able to hang out with her and these people informally, as, uh, you know, like in restaurants and bars and things like that. And 
I heard, you know, I heard about people who had left. It's a, it's a concentration of cooperatives. There are over 360 of them. And there were some people who had left and gone to France to manage larger companies there, even though one of the companies is the second largest retailer in Europe and second largest appliance manufacturer. They're not like tiny little companies, but anyway, they had gone for like three and a half or five years. They had been paid five times as much because in Mondragon you only earn up to seven times more than the person that's starting on the bottom. So there's an equality of income and ownership. It does recognize skill differential, but it's not as extreme in our society. It's amazing. 92% of the people that left, and very few people that leave, 92% came back. Really? Because they said, you know, oh yeah, I had a chauffeur limousine, I had a helicopter, but you know, it wasn't the same. Now, qualitatively, you can't define that, but if you could ask a question about how long have you worked in cooperatives, get a longitudinal thing, some kind of sense of, of why compared to have you also worked in private industry, what is the difference for you? And I'm not saying that that would, what that's going to say, I don't know, but it, it's like, I was floored when I heard it was 92%. And the other thing was, I noticed all the ownership things were different, not just within the factories, but like men's and women's relationship or couples relationship. There wasn't that sense of ownership. No little signals like, oh dear, you know, like you're, you're my possession or you're my intimate partner. I said to my advisor, I said, Chris, after three days, I can't tell who the couples are, you know, because we go out to dinner. And she said, I couldn't either for like months. Oh, she first started to research. That is fascinating, the way that the children relate to the adults, they're much more self-assured. <coughs> Without, when everybody is an owner with some equality, it influences all the social relationships. Mm -hmm. But we can't measure that necessarily in a survey, but it would be so nice to capture this qualitative difference in some way, you know? That's all I it sounds like you're reading our mind. Like there are, like we are, <laughs> we're trying to gauge the level of solidaritiness in the survey, including oh, wow. those dimensions yeah. of like equity and inclusion. I mean, all those things yeah. that Daniel was yeah. talking about, and that certainly Emily was mentioning. But if that's right, I would find that the latest statistics, if it's 92 percent that come back, even from far higher paying jobs, that says something that you know money can't buy is there. So um, just thinking broadly about how you capture those sorts of qualitative differences yeah, yeah. other than um, uh, through interviews. Um, um, I mean we have other means of reporting, um, including video, which um, 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 the sampling of some of these in the of adventures on the video, you could capture quite a bit using space. Um, discourse within the organization and yeah. I just thought I would take that opportunity for a moment to remind everyone that in our uh, packets we have upcoming events and one of them is uh, showing a video called Ship Change. Thank you. Which um, it, it, it does exactly what you're talking about, right? Sort of like the video that ASA showed too, a whole series of narratives about cooperative initiatives made by Thank you. Right, so that's happening very soon around here, so that's one way in which, you know, I think you're right, like it's... And, and the filmmaker will be there. Yeah, and the filmmaker will be there. Um, can I... Um... No, <laughs> I guess I've been thinking about a lot of different things, and I don't know where we'll be going for. Um, things I'm interested in are one, this idea of that in the process of asking these questions, you're also influencing the subject that you're studying in defining themselves. What if they are part of the solidarity economy and what their role is? Because asking these questions, they may not have thought about it. So you're not just studying something static. It's influenced by the act of you asking it, and in return, their questions and their needs in the process of interviewing them will influence the continuing um, nature of the study, so it isn't just this outside and thing, it's a dialogic process. 
I'd also be interested in looking at what other people have done in mapping the US solidarity economy like stuff um, on like the most general scale, like local first and their like um, directories, and then like the data commons project and the work that they're doing mapping um, cooperatives specifically. Uh, I've also been um, reading a lot of like graphic design, like Edward Tufte visual representation of information stuff. And that's like, it's really cool stuff because it's all about how like you have all this data and then the way it's presented is really like the one slide or the one image is the thing that can like change someone's mind or make something, make a paradigm shift happen um, somewhere. And I'd like to see not like, that to see that integrate into the process of collecting the information so that we don't come to this point where the we go out, we do all these interviews, and then what we stuck with in the end is a vast amount of information, and then we start to try and make it into something coherent or categorize it, and to sort of like integrate like not just aesthetic, but also like um, that sort of mapping mentality, sort of the accessibility side of it into gathering in the information we're making. I can answer a little bit. Um, so uh, the, how the process of mapping can actually change the, the, the subject. Uh, so the, a good example is um, Dejar Horn, who she's on the SEN board. She came up from New Jersey. Um, so she, uh, she reached out to SEN and she wanted to do a mapping project in Asbury Park. And so with, with the support of, of some of our folks, um, they did this project, and as they, these people who have never heard the term before, mm -hmm. but as they talked about it, and they, they opened up the question, like, well, to us, what is solidarity economy? Mm -hmm. What are examples? And they started identifying things, mm -hmm. and then they started thinking, well, uh, uh, well, we can start this kind of business that we do right. with XYZ. Right. So they started up some, some cooperatives out of that process. So it's a great example of where mapping has directly led to sort of some kind of like a, a transformation of, of the people and led to concrete actions. Um, and the other part of that story that our colleague Melina Safra, one of our mapping team, has told is that some of those community conversations were also thinking about, well, you know, what should be inside or outside of the solidarity economy? Mm -hmm. And then some community-based financial institutions, for instance, are clearly not part of it, and some are for them. And so I think that's the op opposite side of like the more open-ended mm -hmm. question you were suggesting, Judy, which is, you know, why are you a part of it? And I think that'd be an interesting, like in, in the context of like a general cash the net widely sort of self-identified as part of the solidarity economy. I, I'm wondering, for instance, like you know, people from religious communities or the millions of people involved in the mutual aid practice known as the recovery movement, right? Like, is that solidarity economy right. or isn't it? I mean, if you think about the economic value of having people live sober lives, like you know. That plays a big role in the success of organizations mm -hmm. like Epica, for instance. Yeah. Um, you know, mm -hmm. so, so this is the other where, thing I want where to are the limits here? The I'm not so sure I know. Self-identification mm -hmm. and um, the discussions we've had mm -hmm. um, among just four of us spending a total of over 20 hours just kind of going through that and not reaching any consensus. Right. Consensus on a lot of things, but not complete consensus. Um, and in the end, settling for, this is the first round, we're gonna go with these, these are what we could agree on, yeah. and then to be continued. Mm -hmm. Probably the biggest um, area of conflict was that capitalist versus non-capitalist. Yeah. So, um, you know, there was, there was one, for, one of the four who felt really strongly that by excluding really good capitalist firms, and I do believe that there are good, I mean, good-hearted, uh, nobly intentioned owners. Um, and, and so this person was saying they're doing everything right in terms of race and, and, and gender and environment and uh, you know paying their workers well, and they even consult with their workers, right? And they should be included. And that by, by excluding them on the grounds that they're not like fundamentally, institutionally, structurally democratic, is privileging that class owner worker class dimension over everything else that they're doing right. Mm -hmm. And others of us were saying, yes, but if if there if there is something about the structure 
of, a, of an enterprise that is fundamentally at odds with our, in this case, principle of democratic uh, operation, then that's problematic. No. Um, so we never came to agreement on that, but that was uh, like, that cycled around over and over in, in worker co-ops, and then it also came around in, you know, producer co-ops, right? If there's if there's a producer co-op, but their workers don't aren't part of the decision making process and aren't part owners, or or food co-ops where the consumers control it, but the workers might not have uh, say. This came up over and over, um, and uh, you know, that's a that's a real live thing. So, um, I mean, my what I felt like what we could do is is create because I think it's a little problematic to say um, I mean, I think that we need to have a long term vision and we need to be aiming towards something that that in the end isn't about the, you know uh, an individual who has a really good heart because when they retire or they sell off the business who knows what happens um, and and maybe they even have a change of heart if it's not structured into the DNA of the company. Then who knows what happens? Yeah. Uh, and so I think that a place, a way to do it is to have allies, right? And why not? Right? So I, I mean, I think we're in, in, in Springfield. We're, we're happy to work with anybody yeah. who we can. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to say, oh, you're only an ally. We're, we're happy to work with them. Yeah. But but when we make the map, I, I think it's okay to say these are our principles. These are the this is sort of the boundaries are fuzzy. Here are the ones that we really know that are within the boundaries. They're really consistent. Um, and though there might be, be individual bad ones, there might be really bad co-ops. In which case, we can exclude them. But as a, as a structure, yeah, that's, that's a good thing. Right, and then have like a whole universe of, of allies, and that's fine. In practical terms and real world uh, transformation, you work with all comers. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, nobody's left. I can't see your name. Oh, no, John. So, it's not, it's, you guys are making it pretty clear, totally clear. So you sort of have established a benchmark for what solidarity is at its like sort of lowest like definitions. You sort of you sort of in your group define what solidarity means to you guys and what it'll mean for the mapping, or is it what well, distracted from something? I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, I, just listening to Emily, because um, I wasn't actually part of that conversation about refining the categories. It sounds like we've defined the categories for the math that we're going to make. But the question of like the inside or outside of the solidarity economy is another one entirely, which is an interesting thing about, like, so maps become like a moment in a conversation where you make a statement. And like, well, why did you do that? Mm -hmm. um, but I will say that we, we're drawing not only on we're drawing partly on what's going on in other parts of the world. So there's other parts of the world that are, are far ahead of us, particularly Latin America is far ahead of us um, in terms of the solidarity economy movement. Now, in Latin America, in general, they're far stronger and far clearer. Absolutely, they're anti-capitalist. Not just anti-neoliberal, but they're anti-capitalist. I think we're pretty close in the US to that. I mean, there might be a few dissenters, but I mean, I think we all agree that it's about transformation. And if you're saying really fundamentally transforming the capitalist system, then, then that, I mean, I think you end up being an anti-capitalist. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 you know, this business about, even this business about do we include the good capitalists, the caring capitalists, mm -hmm. it's a bit more strategic, right? Um, but ultimately, even those people would agree that we need a pretty thoroughgoing radical transformation of the economy. I think we're clear about that. Yeah. It, I am reminded here of a of a crowdsourced map that was made recently in Boston, and the object of the map was pretty straightforward. It was where do neighborhoods begin or end, and it was by street. But one of the things they did when they made the map was um, they would say, okay, 70% of the people agree that Dorchester ends here and the next neighboring community begins there. And then, you know, 60 people, like they, so they had like a, like layer after layer of how much consensus there was on where the boundaries were. So, you know, another iteration of this map could really be about kind of the borderlands of the solidarity economy. And one of the reasons why it might be important to include progressive capitalists is that there are organizations like the Ohio Center for Employee Ownership whose like raison d'etre is how to transition your firm from 
Musk from, you know, say, sole proprietor capitalist or family capitalist into worker ownership, whether it's ESOP model or a cooperative. So, I mean, again, that might be a second point in the conversation um, where it's like, okay, if we're not going to exclude people um, and we're inside of this system, or as you said the other day, it's in, at uh, Worcester State, like, we have to build a what we want of the one that we're living in now. Like, we can't wish that Worcester didn't have 1,200 brownfields. We have to garden here and deal with that soil in the metaphorical sense of the term, and literal. Yeah. So it's, yeah. It's really interesting to me, it's like, what is and what isn't, it's just like, I mean, you can say it's so much like semantical infighting, but it's also like, a lot of it's really confronting the conflicts between inside the movement. Like, are unions part of the solidarity economy? I mean, in the sense that they're fighting for, um, greater worker representation in the decision-making process, but at the same time, insofar as unions are an intermediary between workers and the management, cooperative, true worker control makes unions obsolete. So then, how do you build a relationship that's based right. on- As, on as you know, that tension you just identified goes all the way back to the yeah. 19th century. Right. The tensions between co-ops and unions and Marxists and all other things. <laughs> What, what do you do with things like, I mean, I don't get treat by sociocracy or dynamic governance, but what do you do with the claims? I mean, it came out of like a Quaker polity along with cybernetic ideas of, of management, but it's used by a lot of nonprofit groups, especially co housing groups, which tend to be upper middle class in the US. But in Europe, it's used by Heineken, it's used by the European division of Shell Oil. It's not people I would want to hang out with. What's the end? Sociocracy, it's, it's, it's governance by consent and it, it ensures that there's not only top-down coordination but bottom-up representation in every decision. Yeah, sure. So, well, it's pretty interesting in that way. I don't know. I, I don't know anything about the history of it, but I'm, I'm saying here's a, a, a method that is, that is replacing unions. Maybe that's why the corporations are interested uh -huh. in some mm. European companies, but it's used, but it gives the workers a real decision voice on, on everything, from shop things to, to how they're spending profits in the community, et cetera. But it's is it good? Is it bad? I don't know. It would know. be interesting to look at the constraints on their decisions. Yeah, or what the real limits of it are. Right, yeah, they yeah, would be. Like I don't know. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm sure saying, what about all these hybrid junk? Where does it end up here? Oh, I was going to, I have a question, like, uh, for the mapping, I, I hear it, everything kind of, like, by determining categories, it seems like, is there going to be, like, a single map representation of this kind of thing, a series of maps, or? Let's talk about labels. Or symbol. So if it's an enterprise that has one symbol, it kind of just has something to do with consumption, maybe it has to do So our colleague Craig uh, Borowick in um, uh, Philadelphia, like, if you look at his map of the solidarity economy down there, there's, there's symbolic differentiation by sector. Because I say, like, everything kind of really, it, it's all just a matter of spectrum. It's where it's it's not, everything is a fuzzy border. There is no clear definition. So maybe the pot, it's, the, the power of the information we can obtain is kind of by understanding this and under and understanding uh trying to think of a good way to say it that the many different ways of representing representing this information is going to be more powerful than like you know adhering to like well this kind of cate categorical means this kind of this is this and for great examples the unions like where do you fit a union on a scale like this. I mean, you know, Dajar uh, um, was just talking to me about the union that she works for, which is the Union of Medical Residents. So I'm s I don't know if this is correct, but I'm assuming what that means is like doctors in training. Mm -hmm. Am I right about that? Mm -hmm. those, those poor staffs who like work 100 hours a week. Yeah. Um, not a very big union, but one of the things that she's thinking about is, you know, like uh, like what um, Stacy Cordero was saying in our previous session, like a model like Evergreen that isn't so um, top down, and what role could like union pension funds or other sorts of capital that they have control you know, over? What role could that play in producing, mm -hmm. uh, underwriting a cooperative economy? You know, and what if it could get leveraged through public banks or through other kinds of not alternative, just different <laughs> financial <laughs> institutions? 
Just right. Just right. So again, it's yeah, it, it really like what's at stake in the boundary is is on some level semantic, but it's also it's really about like that's a moment where we can practice solidarity or not. Um, I, I think that right there, um, I know my hand was up and I'm just talking, but um, I, um, and that the notion of moments of solidarity, I think, is really important and experiences of solidarity, not just enterprises of solidarity. Um, so I, I recently was uh, reading J.K. Gibson Graham's The Post-Capitalist Politics, where they break down this fictitious enterprise into all of its individual uh, uh, exchanges and categorizes them as like you know, capitalist, non-capitalist, alternative <laughs> capitalist, or solidarity, or whatever. I mean, any category can be put there. I don't know if that makes sense at all in this kind of mapping context. But it seems like something that might be worth exploring at least a little bit. Because you do have the really good capitalist organizations where it is written in their DNA that they are capitalists, but at the same time they're doing all of this other wonderful stuff. Mm -hmm. So by categorizing uh, different exchanges and maybe you know the percentage of exchange ranks, the percentage of solidarityness in the organization, something mm -hmm. like that could be useful, albeit much harder. But at the same time, I'm also like I see it as very problematic that we, there's a group of academics deciding who counts and who doesn't. I mean, that's it, how do you avoid like vanguardism mm -hmm. in, in this kind of context? Like that's this it essentially violates in some regards the principles of solidarity. Well, I just have to speak. It's not a defense, but just to say what the plan. Is. So for the mapping, the, first of all, the NSF mapping, the grant is a very particular thing. NSF has all their requirements and it's really an academic thing. That's the nature of that. So the plan from there is um, that we have gone through this exercise in, among four people and we're actually in the process of figuring out how best to like broaden that discussion. I think it was very useful to go through this very intensive discussion with such a small group and be able to at least um, more clearly articulate and identify some of the really conflictual areas, and there may be many more that bubble up over time. Um, but the plan is definitely to open it up um, maybe in a slightly enlarged circle and see how to kind of uh, process the conversation and then eventually open it up to at least, you know, the SEN network or really a broader. So yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that, that this is just one incarnation yeah. of an ongoing thing with the U.S. Solidarity yeah. Network. The I NSF think you thing for years. is very yeah. particular. I, I love that question, though, of like, if I understand what you're saying, John, of like, in, like various input flows, and that some input flows into, say, a capitalist corporation could be coming from cooperatives or coming from independent producers. Why would you consider to be capitalists? They're not engaged in exploitation. So then the question is, how would you visually represent flows? And the thing that came to mind was, remember Aquafresh, that toothpaste that had like multiple <laughs> colors? That you could have sort of, you know, I don't know if Tufty would approve, but um, <laughs> you, you can map flows and represent them visually. Like, you know, they Yeah, you know what, it's four o'clock, and I think this session was supposed to go till, um, 3.45 initially, but we moved everything back half an hour, so we're going to 4.15, which means the leader will be expanded to include or support other aspects of the solidarity economy, and what are the barriers and areas of convergence. So I guess it's kind of like a meta-reflection moment, because I actually feel like we were dealing with those questions all the way through. So, but we need, this is for the record. <laughs> so maybe, I mean, my Worcester State teacher self is coming through here big time. Um, I found it hard to answer those questions exactly, so I'll just throw something out that uh, struck me about our conversation, which is that the process of mapping is really a process of um, forming an identity around and a definition of what is solidarity and what is not. And um, and also like, yeah, just obstacles. Like, you start drawing lines like that, you know, and like all like, 
difficulties that arise out of that. But I think there's also a like, room for opportunity there too. Mm -hmm. Like about the yeah. what? What is the solidarity? Being solidarity, how do you define it? Who, and who decide? Who defines it? Who decides who's in, who's out? Um, and um, actually, Asa gave me ideas for um, how um, this project might be expanded and. Um, specifically with the questions that we are asking ourselves now um, when you ask yourself or when you're when you're working with your with these questions of um, um, where am I in this green solidarity economy to also ask questions about uh, where am I not you know what um, uh, are there ways that I could be more SE, <laughs> uh, um, more GSE? Um, um, to have to have to sort of you know challenge people who are um, on, uh, placing themselves on the map. Um, to think more broadly about um, how, uh, where they're placed, and you know how they, um, are you know, are there ways that they could work uh, with other initiatives? I don't know. So, um, for the first question. I kind of felt like we talked a lot about like the technical and practical application of like understanding the solidarity economy because once you start creating maps and like we talked a little bit about the implant software and how that as a technology could be implemented to work within mapping the solidarity economy. So. And then um, other aspects of solidarity economy, I felt like like you said sustainability would be sort of encouraged a lot through giving businesses an opportunity to make, to like have a sort of all their processes and all their inputs be sustainable. So not just having a sustainable product, but have all of your inputs being sustainable and creating a network that is sustainable and in solidarity. And the last one, um, so talk about creating an identity, which is, sort of the whole idea of mapping, but it is also the challenge of mapping, So, because you don't want too narrow an identity. Like, you guys say that you want the solidarity economy movement to be a radical economic movement, and in order to be radical, you have to alienate groups anyway. So like, kind of by definition, you wouldn't want the capitalist companies, but like Jonathan was saying, they're still in solidarity in some way, so it's like, Again, with like the semantics and stuff like that, it kind of creates a challenge. Yeah, I was actually thinking the same thing, like how important it is in defining this movement and making it so those that might have those same solidarity principles can see themselves as that, or maybe steps in the future to work towards and um, just creating more inclusivity of how solidarity, all these things exist. And I kind of think the goal is for that is because of spatial diffusion. We want this to expand to other areas. We want this to grow. Um, different way of doing things that's based on these requirements and it's the stress build up from this comparing to the profit motive and how that's kind of going to play out.